a, a little bit about uh, what some of those uh, people did. And so um, I'm real happy to be able to introduce the daughter of one of our charter members who will reread her mother's paper for, uh, for us this evening, Phyllis Marshall. Yes? Are you ready? <laughs> okay, let's uh, welcome uh, Phyllis Marshall. Good evening. I know a lot of you, many of you are more, much more familiar with this information than I am. I listened to it when I was young, it went right over my head, and I really regret it now. There are pictures over there. Uh, the other museums and also some that, that Jim brought in, some albums. Is the sound on this all right or too close? All right. Uh, Mom was quite, she wrote a lot. <laughs> and uh, the first few pages were about the immigration, the steerage, uh, the passage, how long it took, how many people died, um, and of uh, what diseases, as, as well as just the crowded accommodations, how there were brokers in the old country just begging people to come to the new world and settle it. And a lot of them trickled down to here. We had trickle down even then. For most, uh, for most people in Germany, life was unendurable. They left the fatherland in streams, and when their government intervened to detain them, if they could afford it, they resorted to illegal agents who smuggled them out, who emigrated. The steerage passenger list of the ship Meta, sailing for New York on April 17, 1843, gives an idea. Out of 96 German passengers, there were 27 farmers, two salesmen, four tailors, three shoemakers, two smiths, two turners, two cabinet makers, two carpenters, one plasterer, one saddle make one saddler, one baker, one butcher, one musician, one basket maker, one clock maker, one soap boiler. The other 44 were women, children, and old people. One family had 19 members. Most immigrants were between 20 and 30 years old, but this shipload included two old women in their 70s, and it's quite likely there were several who were deficient mentally and physically. Of course, there were different classes of Germans, the artisans as well as the farmers, the well-to-do as well as the very poor, but that was true of any nationality. We have heard of Shanty Irish and Lace Curtain Irish. In a recent Ann Landers column, she said the Lace Curtain Irish had fruit in the house when no one was sick, and an Irishman wrote in to tell her that they were the ones that had flowers in the house when no one was dead. Skilled craftsmen who brought their tools with them had the best chance of making good. Sturdy peasants put fine work in factories, on farms, or as laborers, building railways or canals. But the language barrier and the risk of being cheated were, were often too much for them, and much grief was the result. Artists, scholars, and students had the poorest chances of making good. Not a few German immigrants were men of some means who could see no use to these means to could see a well could see no way to use these means to advantage in the old country and there were some alarm in the german states at the continued departure of small capital a survey in 1856 in the new york in new york disclosed that the average immigrant possessed about 70 dollars or more money than the average american one German farmer admitted to possessing $25, but when he found out that, that his money would not be taxed or taken from him, produced evidence of a bank account of $2,700. In addition to cash, many had tools, jewelry, and other valuables with them. The reason why so many Germans chose the vicinity around us for their new home lies in the graves of the immigrants themselves. Whether it was through the exhortations of the agents of ships, railroads, or the state, it is now unknown. Michigan in 1857 was still a wilderness except for a few settlements. But that they did come by the hundreds is very evident. Offhand, we can think of John Hawk Street in Garden City, Warman Road to the south, Still Wagon, named after German settlers. 
There were also many name changes. Kurt House became Kurtzel, Bingo became Bingo, and Johann Smith became plain John Smith. Many of the settlers and their families remained quietly in the background, content to rent, run their farm shops or working as laborers, making no claim to fame or prominence. Others took part in civic affairs and are regard, recorded in the annals of the city and townships. There were and are the landmarks with German backgrounds, the old commercial hotel in Wayne, I think there are pictures over there, was at one time said to be one of the finest hostelries in Michigan for a town of this size. It was run by Mr. and Mrs. Blumenschmidt, German immigrants. There are at least two, two centennial farms, the Bengals and the Hazelbacks. I think they're both gone now. Remember, this was written in 1964. And then there were the Franks. There was the Gerbstedt's Bakery. There is the Lee Gerbstedt Building, 1964. There was Engler's Smitty and the old Kurtzel Inn at Inkster. There was the Youth Memorial Funeral Home. There, was promise, there were prominent Wayne citizens, Peter Anthony and Joseph Snyder, Ta tavern owner George Weberline. Other names were Sch Schwartz, Schultz, Steinhauers, Went, Greisel, Boltz, Drager, Dittmar, Zimmerman, the list is endless. There were so many it would be impossible to give biog biographical sketches of them all. During various programs, we have heard some of them, and we will give short reviews of, of these and add to a few more new names to the roster. Silas Farmer's Book of Historic History of Detroit and Wayne County lists many of the German heritage, especially from Taylor, Huron, and Romulus townships. It reads like a passenger list from an emigrant ship. Many of the descendants of these have made their homes here and, and so have become part of our community. The following biographies cover a period of more than a century. One of the prominent families who came here more than a hundred years ago were Michael and Elizabeth Stellwagen, who arrived in Detroit on July 4, 1851, from Nieder Salheim, Hesse, Darmstadt, Germany. Not part of that, right? It used to be part of my name. They brought, bought land less than a mile west of Wayne, where Michael died not many years later at the age of 46. The farm remained in the family until recently when it was absorbed by the Lincoln Mercury plant. Their oldest son was George, born in 1840. We have a lengthy biography of his life in our files. He accomplished so much it would be, take too long to go into all the details. He was in the Civil War, later became a prominent merchant, had a grain elevator, a wool business, and was one of the principal organizers of the Wayne Savings Bank, where he was cashier. He was town treasurer, township supervisor for four years, and in 1885 was elected county sheriff for two years. His public life began when he was 24, that would be 1864, coinciding with the growth of the town. He married Isabel Hall and they had four children, Florence, a Wayne High graduate uh, and a teacher of music, George, who became a cashier in the bank, Isabel, and Estelle Louise. He was a member of the Congregational Church and its treasurer for a number of years. Other children of Michael and Elizabeth also became prominent in the community. They were John Jacob, born in 1843. Well, there were children born in Germany and here until 1857. Michael, with Elizabeth's husband, Charles Knoch, had a hardware store here. Philip became a farmer and was a father of Clara and Mary, both of whom became teachers. John Christian was a Stillwagon of Stillwagon and Snyder's farm store. John Jacob remained on the farm of his father until his death. He was the father of Elizabeth, who became principal of Wayne High School. Augustus was a prominent Detroit attorney. William went west for a time. I have my page here. The Pinoches and Michael Stillwagon and perhaps William later went up to St. Ignace to make their homes. Another wing German of this period was Christian Lohr. We have pictures over there. He himself did not come from Germany, but his father Frederick came with his father, settling on a farm near Canton in Canton Township, where the 
where they were the first of the of the German settlers. Christian's boyhood was spent in Canton, and when he was 24 years of age, started a farm for himself near his boyhood home. He had a saw and feed mill on his farm for about seven years, then sold out and came to Wayne, where he became proprietor of Wayne Flowering Mills. He was known as a chicken fancier and breeder, was the owner of the Millside Poultry Yard. He exhibited at various poultry shows with much success, and in the late 1880s was prime mover in arranging and conducting a popular poultry exhibit at Wayne. Well, that's more than goes on at Wayne now. <laughs> <laughs> that goes to Henry Loss, a name which keeps appearing in various places in Wayne's affairs is that of Henry Loss. He was born January 24, 1845, in Mecklenburg, Germany, the son of Frederick. In 1857, when Henry was 12, the family came to Michigan, settling at Dundee. He did farm work in summer, worked for his board in the winter, and attended school as regularly as possible. He picked up a fair business education. When the Civil War started, he tried to enlist, but he he found his youth and his short stature a handicap, and the recruiting officer would not accept him for the ranks. He then sought a position as drummer boy, and in August 1861, at Saline, he entered Company E of the 6th Michigan Infantry. He served in that capacity with Historic 6th during its campaign in Louisiana, taking part in the Battle at Baton Rouge and the siege and fall of Port Hudson. He was struck on the temple by a spent ball at Baton Rouge. He was knocked senseless and reported dead. This report reached Michigan, and with the customary honor of the fallen soldier, his funeral service was preached. There was much rejoicing among his friends when they learned he was alive and well. This is an event few men can claim. <coughs> because of illness, he was discharged in June 1864 and came home to recuperate. The, the war was still on, though, and after his recovery, he had his old desire to be back with the boys. Accordingly, in September 1864, he re-enlisted in Company B of the famous 24th Michigan as a recruit in the ranks. He remained with this outfit through the rest of the war and was discharged June 6, 1865, as corporal. In 1870, with T.E. Deming, he opened a hardware store in Wayne which he was associated with for 13 years. Then he went to Pierre, South Dakota in 1883, located on land when the Dakotas were open for settlement. Proved up his claim, which took about 18 months. The hardships of pioneer life in the Dakotas was not for him, though, and in the fall of 1885, he returned to Wayne and reopened the, this, reopened the hardware store. He closed it again in October 1896 when he became village postmaster. He also served as town treasurer and as a member of the jury commission. He married Elsie Cole, no, Ella Cole of Shiawassee County in 1879. She died in 1894. Mr. Loss was a, ma a mason and a member and treasurer of the Congregational Church. Manius U. In more recent times, Wayne had, was very fortunate in having as one of her most eminent, respected, and well-liked citizens another descendant of German ancestry. This is the late Manus U. Am I pronouncing that first name right? Manus U. Well, I'll just say M U, and you'll know who I'm talking about. Yes. My lips are getting just a little bit dry. <laughs> his civic enterprises are a matter of record, but none of us will ever know his private philanthropies, of which there were many. His grandfather, Dominic U, after first going to Erie, Pennsylvania, went up to Marquette, Michigan. In 1832, he came down to Detroit to make his home. He was a cabinet maker and a carpenter and built many houses on Congress Street, which at least until recently were still standing. In 1856, wishing to retire, he went to New Boston and purchased a 40-acre farm. He at once started to build a house upon it, and in 1857, when his son George was just three weeks old, the family moved into their new home. Dominic U. could not stay retired, though, and took up his old trade. Along with carpentry and cabinet making, he was called upon to make coffins, and this led him eventually into conducting funerals. His son George also followed this business when he became of age to do so. It was a suggestion of M. U. that 
led to the acquisition by our society of the notebook of Reverend David J. Parker, a Baptist minister. In this record book is the following item, State of Michigan, County of Wayne. This certifies that on the 21st day of January, 1884, at Van Buren in the County of Wayne in the State of Michigan, Mr. George V. Oat, spelled O-T-E here, color white of New Boston, Michigan, age 26, born in Detroit, Michigan, by occupation undertaker, and Miss Lizzie M. Roach, color white of Romulus, Michigan, age 22, born in Marquette, Michigan, were united by me in matrimony according to the laws of the state of Michigan. The witnesses to this marriage were Mr. Thomas Roach of Romulus and Mrs. Josephine Rumsey of New Boston, Michigan. Given under my hand at Van Buren, Michigan, this 21st day of January, 1884, David J. Parker, Minister of the Gospel, present $3. The children of George were Mattis, the only son, and four daughters, Mrs. George Eva Benjamin, Mrs. William Newson, Newsom, uh, Rena, Mrs. Russell Parr, Vaughn Parr, and Mrs. Josephine Curtis, mother of Councilman Charge Curtis, Charles Curtis. M. U. married Mary Newsom of Romulus, who was a twin sister of Rena's husband, William, on August 10th of 1911. In 1925, he bought out the funeral business of W. D. Morton and resided in Wayne until his death in, 18, in 1961. He improved the establishment and became the first funeral home in this area. There are pictures over that of, of there of how it looked when he bought it and then the, the new site. About 1948, he acquired a partner, Harold Rodesky, who with Mrs. Ute as silent partner conducted the business now known as Ute Memorial Funeral Home. The highest honor of the funeral business is being a member of the Order of the Golden Rule. Mr. Ute received this honor in 1925. The motto of the order is service measured not by gold, but by the Golden Rule. And such was the service given by Mr. Ute, not just to his business, but to the entire community and all phases of his life. The heritage, heritage of the Herkimers. Now the Herkimers don't seem to be from here. I think they're Belleville. But I remember when Mom came home from going out to dinner one night, very excited because she had met somebody. And they talked about history. And she was just thrilled. And I didn't pay much attention to her then. And I'm really sorry. There are two sources of information on people. The first is family tradition and imperfect memories. The second, documented sources. Those consisting of court records, contemporary newspaper accounts, documents, letters, and so forth. It is rather frustrating that the following sketch is incomplete in its Michigan aspects. It should contain more names and dates, but when you consider that my informant was questioned without previous notice at dinner hour in a Howard Johnson's restaurant, it is understandable that complete surprise resulted with insufficient information. In presenting this, there is also the dividing line between what is history and what is biography. For the historical part, it is indeed documented in many places. In New York State, about 10 miles from the city of Herkimer, which was settled in 1725 by the Palatines, on the southern slope of the Mohawk Valley is a substantial brick mansion called Herkimer House. This was the home of General Nicholas Herkimer of the Continental Army, and the house had been restored and it has been restored and is maintained by New York State as a museum. There is also, beside the city, a Fort Herkimer and other pertinent landmarks. The books, drum, books Drummers Along the Mohawk and Lake Ontario gave documented accounts of the crucial battles near Oriskany, New York, which tell of the general's bravery in battle and the near fight fiasco caused by the disobedience of his orders by some of his officers, and how he directed the men to the, who did remain faithful, seated on a saddle under a tree after he had sustained severe wounds in his leg. They finally won the skirmish, which had lasting good influence on the further frontier warfare of the War of Independence. It is tragic that he died of his wound, and this story is, is also colorful. 
Mr. General Herkimer came to America in 1709 with his father and at least one brother. They came with a group of 3,000 or so Palatines who settled first in the Hudson Valley at Newburgh, New York. The Palatines were people who had left their homeland in Lower Palatine region of Germany because of the devastation caused by the wars of Louis XIV. After leaving Germany, the group first went to England, and from there they were transported to New York at the expense of the British government, and were given land at Newburgh in return for their work on naval stores, which also included shipbuilding. In a sense, they were redemptioners, but they, they were not sold as bondsmen because the British government had paid for their passage. One account says the scheme was not wholly successful, and after their debt was paid to Great Britain, they left Newburgh and some went to the German flats along the Mohawk, and some went to the predominantly Dutch reason, region of the Lower Hudson, and some to Pennsylvania and further. Having settled in Newburgh in 1709, the Herkimers, and Herkimer in 1725, this shows a period of approximately 16 years which it took to work off the cost of their passage to the colonies. The aforesaid brother of General Herkimer became a fur trader, and it, and his several times great-grandson, J. Herkimer, was the mayor of Belleville, from whom this information was obtained, said that he was far more of a success as a fur trader than he had been as a shipbuilder. J.'s great-grandfather with his two sons, and there may have been others, were the first of the Her Herkimers to come to Michigan, settling at Flat Rock, where Herkimer Sr. was a millwright, electing se erecting several mills in that locality. Here, unfortunately, first names and dates are lacking. That Mr. Herkimer had a sister or sister-in-law in Michigan also is evident from the following anecdote. This lady had her home a distance from Flat Rock, and one day her nephews, one was Jay's grandfather, a carpenter, and his brother, who was a brickmaker, went to visit her, walking along Stony Creek to her home. Along the way, they came upon some land which appealed to both of them, the soil being suitable for brick making. They notched the trees to establish the location, went on to visit the ant, returned to Flat Rock, and filed claim on the desired lands, received their land grants, and built their homes and businesses on it. The fact that we do not have the date of their arrival in Michigan is narrowed down to the time of the government land grants. There are several descendants of this historic family living in Belleville and nearby. J. Herkimer, the mayor, is also associated with the Austin Oil Company in Wayne. His father, Clark Herkimer, was a carpenter with the Wayne County Road Commission here until his retirement some years ago. As to the Centennial Farms, we have heard previously the history of the Bingo Farm, of which two of our members, Mr. and Mrs. Carl Bingo, reside, reside, and there are pictures in there. The other nearby farm is that of Freeman Hazelback on the corner of Van Bourne and Hannon Road in Canton Township. He is a great nephew of the original owner, Christopher Hasselbeck, Jr., who was born in Germany July 7, 1844, with his parents that he came to this vicinity in 1852. He married Flora M. Convus in 1867. Uh, I remember during the Depression, we would drive out that on Van Boren Road to this house, this farm, and buy our unpasteurized milk, and I survived. So <laughs> it was good milk with a lot of cream on the top. And now it comes to Gaudi. And giving this description of German families, we cannot admit the following. You can you watch James. No, I'm watching. Go ahead. No it, problem. <laughs> it wouldn't have been the same same town without them. These are the Prescorns, the Zaletskys, and the Gaudis. They are all related, and care must be taken to distinguish between biography and genealogy. It would be easy to become entangled in the branches of the family tree. <laughs> Frederica Falk was born in Nyken, Mecklenburg, on June 9, 1837. In 1870, she came to America to the home of a brother in Dearborn. In 1871, she was married to Henry Gowdy and lived in Dearborn until 1877 when they moved to a farm in Romulus Township. In 1880, they moved to Nankin Township where they still reside, where they resided until the death of Mr. Gowdy in 1896. Since that time, she made her home with her son Charles in Wayne. 
she was a member of this of St. John's Lutheran Church for more than 50 years at the time of her tragic death, presumably caused when a woolen shawl she was wearing caught fire. She died December 26, 1927, over, 19, over 90 years of age. Her son, Charles Henry, was born October 11, 1874, in Dearborn and came to Wayne about 1895. On December 18, 1897, he was married to German-born Minnie Priestcorn, a daughter of Godfrey and Louise Priestcorn. Charles Gowdy became a legend in Wayne. It does not seem possible that one man could do so many things. He was a section foreman on Michigan Central Railroad for 19 years, after which he went into the coal business for himself across from the old cemetery. Because of his knowledge and a variety of fields, he began to be called upon from time to time to do odd jobs for the village commission until 1913, when village president William Witherall appointed him street commissioner, which title he held until the time of his death. Since he began, began service for the village, he held many appointments, each, and each new title was retained until he claimed seven public offices, the biggest being superintendent of public works. He was the marshal in Wayne, serving before there was an organized police force. He was also the fire chief, water commissioner, plumbing inspector, street commissioner, and building inspector. And of course, there's a great picture of him over there. He died suddenly on October 4th, 1938, while preparing for work, just a few days before his 64th birthday. He was survived by his wife, who was, uh, who would be 90 years old the year this was written in, 19, in 1964. His sons Otto and Henry Gowdy and his two daughters, Mrs. Walter Hattie, Dumkey, and Molly Gowdy. On Mr. Gowdy's death, resolutions were printed in the Wayne papers. One passed by the Wayne Commission in recognition of his great service to Wayne, the other by the Township Board. Both resolutions were ordered to be permanently incorporated in the minutes of the proceedings of each board. Henry Gowdy stepped into the footprints of his father and is now fire chief for the city. Former police chief Larry Knox made the statement a few years ago that Charlie Gowdy carried more law enforcement in his nightstick than in the entire present-day police force carries. At one time, there must have been quite a settlement of Germans in the northeast, in northeast Nankin Township. Articles from old church bulletins and other sources tell of the Dolenskys and Priestcorns living in that locality just east of Benoit Road and north of Palmer. When the marriages of members of these two families came to light, it is revealed that several of them married in, into other families who resided <coughs> in that neighborhood. Some of the names of German families who lived there, other than Priestcorns and Dolenskys, are Schultz, Steinhauers, Liverance, Moores, Falkowski, Pitt, No, and there were others. The farms of the Dolenskys and Priestcorns were at least partially absorbed by Birch Hill Country Club. Godfrey and Louise Priestcorn came to America from Ludwigdorf, West Prussia, in 1882. This information comes from the parish paper of St. John's Lutheran Church, which tells the confirmation of Herman in that year before the rest of his class in order to accompany his parents to America. Godfrey and Louise were the parents of John, August, Herman, Julius, Wilhelmina, which is Minnie, Mary, and Charles. All of them did not come with the parents, according to both Ida Dolesky and Molly Gowdy. Their, their mothers, two girls of the family came before the parents, evidently with other relatives, when mere babies. Minnie was born in 1874 and Mary in 1877. Others may have come before 1882 also. Mary married August Dolesky. Minnie married Charles Gowdy. Julius married Mary, also known as Anna Maria Dolesky. Charles married Martha Schultz. Herman did not marry, and after the death of his parents, previous to 1912, came to Wayne to live with his brother Julius. Herman was 63 when he died in 1930 and had been a member of St. John's Church for 40 years and was a church deacon. He never missed a Sunday service unless he was away, and then he attended service at some other Lutheran church. John Priestcorn died in 1904. It was his son Fred who purchased the Hoops Brothers Meat Market in the spring of 1931. 
It is the family of Julius and Mary Prescorn who lived on 3rd Street so many years ago, just south of Main Street. Julius was employed by the Ford Motor Company until his retirement. He died in 1958, aged 87 years. And his wife, he and his wife had, had 10 children. Uh, this family has done their share to aid the community and still do so. Carl, when he worked with Mr. Gowdy in the fire department, received severe burns which nearly cost him his life while fighting a fire. At this time, we have no proof that Anthony and Mary Doletsky lived in the Northeast Mankin, but it is logical to assume that they did. There were seven children of this couple. August and his wife Mary, Nee Priestcorn, lived on Main Street on the corner of 3rd, the rear of their property, meaning that of Julius Priestcorn, which faced 3rd Street. They came to Wayne in about 1901 after living on the farm in Northeast Mankin for three years after their marriage. They had 13 children. Anna married Elmer Staub, Emma married George Petrosky, Elizabeth married Robert Steinhauer, August, Augusta and Lydia married brothers Leslie and LaBelle Hill. So two families with 22 double cousins grew up on the corner of Main and 3rd Street. They have all been respected citizens of Wayne, members of St. John's Lutheran Church, working for both their community and the church. May we say our German families have done us proud.